All right. Thank you so much, Faye, and uh, thanks everyone for uh, coming out here <laughs> or staying in here. Uh, and I'm really excited to uh, <clears throat> talk a little bit about King's Chapel and the Fugitive Slave Law, uh, especially considering sites along the Freedom Trail, obviously the attention is often on the American Revolution. Um, that's what people think about when they associate with these sites. But uh, as we're always talking about at Faneuil Hall, and it applies to King's Chapel as well, there's history far beyond just the American Revolution. And uh, I'm really excited to share that with you here tonight. So we're going to start in 1849. And we're going to start with the man whose bust we're looking at right now. So this image we're seeing here uh, is from the chapel. This is from the, the front toward um, uh, the uh, communion rail. Um, and this is King's Chapel minister Ephraim Peabody. He was the minister from 1846 until 1856 when he passed away. And he was the minister for a good portion of what we're going to be talking about here tonight. And I want to start with an article he published in 1849 titled Narratives of Fugitive Slaves. And what this article was, he basically reviews the then very popular genre uh, of nonfiction, which was slave narratives. And what these were, these were enslaved people in their own words, explaining their experience being enslaved and their experience uh, escaping from slavery, the lengths they often would have to go to get out of bondage. And these were very popular uh, among readers because they're compelling reads even today. Uh, but even more, abolitionists at that time viewed these narratives as a tool to sort of show Northern whites what the enslaved experience was like, how brutal, how horrible it was, and the lengths that people would go to escape. So abolitionists viewed these, again, as tools to kind of promote the idea of abolition. Now, in his article, Peabody discusses a whole bunch of, uh, or a number of really popular narratives at that time, and two of the most popular uh, were ones that Ephraim Peabody actually has a small part in, which we have here. There we go. Um, uh, and that's the narratives of Frederick Douglass, uh, who's in the middle, and Josiah Henson on uh, the right. So Frederick Douglass uh, escapes from slavery in Maryland and actually goes to New Bedford, Massachusetts. And it was there for the very first time in his life he was paid for a job as a free man. And that job was actually to move coal from the front of Peabody's house, um, and he was paid by uh, Mrs. Peabody two um, silver dollars to move that coal, kind of a profound moment in, in Douglas's life. Uh, in the case of Josiah Henson, he actually escaped to Canada and then created a uh, sort of a space where uh, enslaved people could escape to, and he frequently came down to Boston to raise money for, for this endeavor, and that led him to, to King's Chapel and to Ephraim Peabody. He was a communicant at the chapel when he visited Boston. He was a visitor in Peabody's home, uh, and Peabody's one of the people that would pay, um, uh, give money to his cause of having this, you know, sort of fugitive colony up there in Canada. And Henson's narrative was actually written in part with the help from Peabody. Peabody introduced hence into the people that would write and publish his um, autobiography, because unlike Douglas, he couldn't read or write. So in order to write his autobiography, he had to dictate it. Uh, and he actually dictated it to a member of King's Chapel, Samuel Atkins Elliott, who we're going to be talking about tonight. Um, uh, but Peabody goes on, and he waxes a little poetic on the subject of abolition and what's to be done about the issue of slavery. Um, uh, oop, missing my, there we go. He says, this immense mass of evil will not be heaved from the bosom of the land, except by strenuous exertions of all who see that it is an evil. But if the question, by whom is the work to be done, is answered more particularly, it becomes obvious that the burden and the heat of the day is not to be borne by gentlemen of ease who make speeches at Faneuil Hall or the Tabernacle, nor by the members of the anti-slavery societies, nor by any persons at the North. They may contribute more or less of aid, but the work is to be done, the sacrifices be made, the battle to be fought by those whose homes are in the slave states. If slavery is to be removed, it must be at the final stage through legislative action in those states, and over this, the inhabitants of every other states can have only slight and indirect influence. 
And really what PBD is getting at here is the popular political opinion of his kind of political class, which is what we would call uh, conservative Whigs. And a Whig, that's the political party of the day. And he lays it out here. Slavery is an immense mass of evil, but it's not going to be abolitionists in the North who are going to get rid of it. It's going to have to be done in the South. And it's really up to the states that already have it to get rid of it, as opposed to these states that uh, don't have it, like Massachusetts. And when I first read this uh, a couple of years ago, he mentions here, uh, gentlemen of ease who make speeches at Faneuil Hall or the Tabernacle. And obviously, he's not naming anybody here. But I knew exactly who he was talking about when he said that. And that's these two men here, Wendell Phillips and Theodore Parker, the men who give speeches at Faneuil Hall and the Tabernacle. Now, Wendell Phillips, absolutely a gentleman of ease. His father was the first mayor of Boston. Um, but despite his you know, uh, sort of upper class upbringing, Phillips devoted basically his entire life to the fight against abolition, for civil rights, uh, women's suffrage, Native American sovereignty. Uh, and he frequently gave speeches at Faneuil Hall. And the other, Reverend Theodore Parker, is a minister, the Tabernacle. And he's a Unitarian minister, just like Peabody. Um, but his pulpit is the most radical anti-slavery pulpit um, in Boston. And a little bit later, in February of 1850, we're going to see a response uh, from Wendell Phillips. At Faneuil Hall, both men speak. Theodore Parker speaks first. And in his speech, he offers a little bit of light criticism to the abolitionist movement. What exactly he says is not really important, but Phillips addresses that when he stands up to speak. He says, I rejoice when any man having wide influence in the community will come and tell us of our faults. I am grateful to him for coming here to express his difference with us and give us the benefit of counsel and his criticism. We know that he preaches anti-slavery in his own pulpit and bears his testimony there to the worth of our society and movement, leaving it to the sleek spaniels of King's Chapel and the like to utter their criticisms on the abolitionists in pulpits where they cannot be answered. And the first time I saw this, and I read this, I was thinking like, sleek spaniels, what, what does that mean? And then it actually hit me there that he's calling King's Chapel, he's calling Ephraim Peabody and the members of the congregation dogs to mean a mean, cringing, fawning person here. And the reason he's going to say that, the reason Phillips is going there is because King's Chapel had a reputation at this time uh, for being conservative on the issue of slavery and probably the most conservative on the issue of slavery among Unitarian congregations in Boston at this time. Because the fact is when you look at King's Chapel, you know, in the 1840s and 50s, the congregation is made up of many influential men of Boston. We're talking lawyers and merchants, you know, members of the state Congress, uh, members of the National Congress, a mayor of Boston, and even a justice of the United States Supreme Court. And while, you know, despite what Phillips characterized, not everybody in the congregation was necessarily conservative uh, on the issue of slavery. Um, there's a reason he would say that. There's a reason he would call that out. And that's because of the actions of some of these members who used that influence, that immense influence that they had to promote um, uh, the issue of slavery. And that's what helped give us that 1850 Fugitive Slave Law. Now, before we can get there, we actually have to backtrack a little bit to 1836. This is before Ephraim Peabody was even the minister at King's Chapel. Um, but it's sort of the beginning of the fugitive slave story here in Boston. And that's the case of Commonwealth v. Aves. And uh, what this court case was, basically, um, uh, there was a woman, Mary Slater, who lived down in New Orleans, but she was from Boston. Uh, she came back to Boston to visit her father, Thomas Aves, and because she lived in New Orleans and she was married to a man in Louisiana, um, she owned enslaved people, and she brought with her a six-year-old enslaved girl named Med. Now, while Mary Slater was here in Boston, she got sick, and she left Med with her father uh, on Pinckney Street in Beacon Hill. And members of the Female Anti-Slavery Society in Boston went to abolitionist lawyer Samuel Sewell uh, and asked him to go and issue a writ of habeas corpus. And if you don't know what that is, what that means basically, what they're arguing is that because slavery has been abolished since the 1780s in Massachusetts, uh, Med is being held against her will. She's been kidnapped because she's here enslaved in a place where we don't have slavery. 
And this is going to go before the, um, the court of Massachusetts and defending Thomas Aves, our two men. One pictured here, Benjamin Robbins Curtis, King's Chapel congregant, a member of the Vestry from 1844 to 1852, and his cousin, Charles Pelham Curtis, another congregant and a vestryman from 1826 to 1863. And if you don't know, for those outside the congregation, the vestry is the sort of a governing body, the executive board of the church, and they make decisions uh, for the church um, among the congregation as opposed to decisions for the clergy. And they're going to defend Thomas Aves. And their defense is basically this, that it doesn't matter if Massachusetts has abolished slavery because there is slavery in Louisiana. And it's the jury is not here to decide whether slavery is moral or not. That's not a question. And there's a fugitive slave law on the books. Uh, there's one from 1793. That's clear. Someone who escapes from slavery to another state is to be returned. Now, Chief Justice Lemuel Shaw is going to rule against Aves and in favor of Med. I've excerpted a portion of his decision here. I'm not going to read it. Uh, but to summarize what he says, basically, he states that uh, when a person leaves one state or territory or country and enters another, they are now under the laws of that new state or territory. So there may be slavery in Louisiana, but there's none in Massachusetts, and therefore her status doesn't apply. And he makes clear that the fugitive slave law doesn't apply because Med's not a fugitive. She didn't escape. Uh, Mary Slater brought her here on her own volition. So he says by that, and by nature of the laws of Massachusetts not having slavery, Med is free. And this is a pretty significant moment. This is sort of the beginning of a legal argument against the fugitive slave law, the 1793 version at least, in Boston. And it's this, coupled with the fact that Boston has a really tight-knit Black community uh, that's seated, uh, situated on the uh, other side of Beacon Hill, on the other side of the State House, I should say, toward the West End. And that community offers support um, and protection for those escaping from slavery. So now you have a little bit of the law and this community, and this is part of what's going to attract enslaved people to come to Boston uh, in this time period. Because if you think about it, we're actually pretty far away from the actual divider between slave and free state. We're far from the Mason-Dixon line. So it's going to be things like this that are going to attract someone to go out of their way to get here to Boston. Plus, there's also the port, which uh, makes it pretty easy as well. Now, to get back to King's Chapel here, um, uh, the following year, in 1837, uh, the Boston Anti-Slavery Society requests that they use King's Chapel for their anti-slavery convention. Um, they actually write to a bunch of different locations asking if they can use it. And as you can see here, Francis Oliver, the senior warden, which is the uh, highest non-clergy position in the church, uh, respectfully declines the use of the chapel, saying that they always decline for uh, things that are not related to the church, which is fair. I have every reason to believe that. But when we look a little deeper and we jump ahead a couple of years, we're going to see kind of how the vestry actually feels about the issue of anti-slavery. And this is really going to become clear in 1842 uh, with the case of George Latimer. Um, uh, now, before we get to that, of course, I mentioned Samuel Atkins Elliott because uh, he wrote, um, he dictated uh, rather uh, Josiah Henson's uh, autobiography. Uh, but just a little more details. He's a member of the vestry as well. He's a congregant at King's Chapel. Uh, he was mayor of Boston for a term uh, at this time in the late 1830s. And he's the senior warden, like I mentioned, the, the highest non clergy position in the church uh, from 1840 to 1845. And he's going to be there at this time, 1842 for the case of George Latimer. Now again, uh, I mean, we're not gonna get too bogged down in the details of some of these cases. I'm actually gonna, at the end, drop some links with some more information about a lot of these different things, um, just because I don't wanna be here for hours. But uh, the basis of the case are this. So yeah, here on the left, that's George Latimer, a man who had escaped from slavery. And on the right um, is actually an ad in paper uh, from uh, the man claiming to enslave him uh, and his wife, Rebecca, uh, looking for his return. So George Latimer and his pregnant wife, Rebecca, escape to Boston from Virginia um, uh, via a ship. They come to Boston, but unfortunately, almost immediately upon getting here, uh, George is recognized as being enslaved to James Gray, and he's arrested. And unlike the case of Med, George is a clear fugitive. Uh, it's obvious here, Judge Shaw does not rule in his favor, 
Um, but it's a bit of a cause celeb. And what ends up happening is that abolitionist pressure James Gray to sell George uh, so that he can be freed. And the following year, the uh, state government of Massachusetts actually passes a law they call the personal liberty law, but it's colloquially known as the Latimer law. And what it does is it basically codifies what was stated in Commonwealth v. Aves. It says that the fugitive slave law no longer applies in Massachusetts. If you're enslaved and you enter in Massachusetts, you're free and local authorities uh, are barred from aiding in the return of an enslaved person, which is uh, about as good a victory as can be. But you see, when Latimer was languishing in jail, the abolitionists of Boston went to, I think, every single church in town with a request, and they asked them if they would pray for Latimer's safety and for Latimer's freedom. And some respond enthusiastically, some don't get back to them, some decline saying they have to discuss it more and they can't really talk about it right now. But nobody responds more forcefully than the vestry at King's Chapel. You can see here, King's Chapel, the notice was laid before the vestry who voted to burn it. And this is Samuel Atkins Elliott as the senior warden at this time. This is his vestry. And we can see at least the majority opinion of the vestry in 1842 is that they're so insulted at the idea of praying for George Latimer that they vote to burn that petition. Despite this though, the personal liberty law is passed. And this is what's gonna kind of really put Boston on the map as a place on the Underground Railroad. This is what's gonna lead Frederick Douglass to come here, for example, um, uh, as well as the cases of Lewis and Harriet Hayden, who are pictured on the left, and Ellen and William Craft, uh, two cases that we're often talking about on the Black Heritage Trail. And again, I'm going to drop some links at the end so you can learn a little bit about these uh, really amazing people, really amazing cases. And the point is that Boston is a, a place, a destination on the Underground Railroad. And it's in this time that Ephraim Peabody becomes the minister at King's Chapel. That's in 1846. He publishes that article I mentioned in 1849. And that leads us to 1850, where things actually really heat up. Now, I don't want to get all <laughs> U.S. history one on this, um, but the basics of it is that there's an issue in Congress. They're trying to pass a series of bills called the Compromise of 1850. And what they're trying to deal with, the question they're trying to answer is, how do you sort of organize the territories in the western part of the country uh, into free or slave states? As you can see, there's this sort of tenuous balance between slave and free state. We had the Missouri Compromise in 1821, which sort of divided along a, a line of latitude at the bottom of Missouri to kind of designate between slave and free. Um, and they just fought this war. The US fights the Mexican-American War in the 1840s. And that war uh, was very unpopular in Massachusetts because when Texas declared its independence from Mexico, it did so pretty much exclusively so that they could bring slavery to that territory. Mexico had abolished slavery. Uh, adding Texas to the Union was extremely unpopular in Massachusetts. Even the people we've talked about, the Curtises and Samuel Elliott, or some of the people that spoke out against uh, annexing Texas, because there was a fear that they make Texas into five states. If you think about that, that's 10 more senators there. That's a huge number. But now gold's been discovered in California. California wants to become a state. How do we kind of make this math work with California? Um, with sort of how you divide it. That's the question that's facing Congress at this time. And there's this series of bills called the Compromise of 1850 in Congress trying to answer that question. And basically what they say is that they're going to add California as a free state, but they're going to update the federal fugitive slave law to be much more strict. Because remember, in Massachusetts, they're basically able to make it null and void. They're trying to kind of really strengthen that. And it's going to actually come from Massachusetts that's going to lead to that compromise being passed and that fugitive slave law being passed. Because on the 7th of March, 1850, the Senator from Massachusetts speaks, and that's Daniel Webster, pictured here, the most famous guy to live in my hometown of Marshfield, Massachusetts. I'm not gonna read his words. I'll mention that he spoke for three and a half hours and that was actually short for Daniel Webster. Um, but in his speech, he endorses passing the bill because they need to preserve the union and the best way to do that is to have this fugitive slave law. And as he says here, what right have they in their legislative capacity or any other capacity to endeavor to get round this constitution or to embarrass the free exercise of the rights secured by the constitution to the persons whose slaves escape from them? None at all, none at all. 
So you can see here, arguing in defense of rights, the rights of those enslavers to enslave people here. And for many in Massachusetts, this is uh, sort of a slap in the face. This is a betrayal from Webster for many. Um, but if you already had a problem with Webster, this is kind of the moment where you could kind of say, I told you so. And I have a quote here, courtesy of uh, Ranger Jane uh, from Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. He writes in his diary, two days later, went to town, found everybody complaining of Webster. Fallen, fallen from his high estate is the universal cry. Yet what has there been in Webster's life to lead us to think that he would take any high moral ground on the slavery question? So for some, not really a surprise that Webster uh, spoke this way, that voted this way. And I think Wongful is expressing more or less the majority opinion in Massachusetts, but there are people that support uh, Webster and they hold a meeting at Faneuil Hall. And I have here the list of some of their names and we can see Charles Pelham Curtis, King's Chapel member, Benjamin R. Curtis, King's Chapel member, Edward G. Loring, King's Chapel member, Thomas B. Curtis, King's Chapel member, all those men are related, by the way. And also down on the other end, um, uh, Samuel Elliott uh, as well. All here uh, in support of Webster and endorsing this Compromise of 1850, endorsing the Fugitive Slave Law. And in fact, Samuel Elliott is about to take the national stage because the, he gets elected to Congress and they're gonna vote in favor of the Fugitive Slave Law in September of 1850. We just had the 170th anniversary, it was only a couple weeks ago, or a week ago. And there is only one person from the entire Massachusetts congressional de delegation to vote yes on the slave law, and it's Boston's own congressman, Samuel Elliott, member of King's Chapel. And by the way, I should mention this too, for many of the years that he was on the vestry, he was also the director of music. Uh, he's someone you absolutely would have known in the congregation at this time, someone you would have been aware of, um, uh, sort of running and directing the choir up from the gallery. And when he votes for this, even more than Webster, immense amount of criticism. I'm talking countless speeches from people in Massachusetts, livid that he would vote this way, that he would um, go that path. We can see here, this is actually from New Hampshire, this um, uh, blacklist. These are all of the um, congressmen and senators from the free states who voted yes. Um, uh, Peabody's down, or Peabody. Uh, Elliot's down toward the bottom and they spell his name wrong. Um, and so we need to talk a little bit about what he's voting for here. Why are people so angry about this? Well, the Fugitive Slave Law of 1850 is a lot stricter than the old one from 1793. Federal marshals are going to be tasked with going to towns like Boston and bringing enslaved people who have escaped back to bondage, right? This goes over the Latimer Law. The Latimer Law no longer counts in Massachusetts. Now we have this fugitive slave law that supersedes it. If you are someone who is caught aiding and abetting an enslaved person, you can face six months in jail and a thousand dollar fine. That's a lot of money in 1850. And if you are someone who's enslaved and you're accused of being a fugitive, you're not brought before a jury. You're brought before a commissioner appointed by the government and you're not allowed to testify. It's literally an affidavit from the enslaver against nothing. Uh, and so you can see, this is obviously a devastating piece of legislation to the communities uh, throughout the North and throughout the country who have escaped from slavery. This law is gonna push the Underground Railroad all the way North to Canada. That's now the only place that's safe and it's going to be for a few years here. And I have here some of the criticism that Elliot had um, that I read, uh, found in the, the Liberator newspaper. On the bottom, I'm gonna read here, resolved that it is a matter of congratulation that no New England senator voted in favor of that bill of abomination, the recent fugitive slave bill, and only one New England representative, namely Samuel Elliott of Boston, whose name, unless he repents and humbles himself in sackcloth and ashes, shall be remembered with scorn and contempt in connection with this act until slavery and its supporters are alike forgotten. This is actually spoken at a meeting in Rhode Island by Reverend Samuel May, a fellow Unitarian minister and the son of Joseph May, uh, one of the most influential King's Chapel congregants uh, in history. He's one of the men who's in, in, uh, influential in bringing the church uh, to become Unitarian. Um, so he has connections to the chapel as well, um, a relative of Louisa May Alcott as well. Uh, now above, we have another um, similar resolve. It says here, Resolved that Samuel A. Elliott, representative of Boston, has most signally disgraced the state of Massachusetts 
by his vote in favor of the Fugitive Slave Bill, and that which we should be as false to humanity if we failed to point out the man and transmit the name and the act to our children's children to be by them loathed and abhorred. Now, these are obviously strong words here, but this meeting, where I'm drawing that from, this is actually a meeting on Beacon Hill at the May Street Church, and this is Boston's Black community gathering to respond to the Fugitive Slave Law. And this meeting was actually organized by Lewis Hayden, a man who had been a fugitive slave um, himself only a few years prior. He'd escaped with his wife and his adopted child. Uh, and it was actually also organized by William Cooper Nell, who was not a fugitive slave. He was born free, uh, but a really interesting guy, someone we're often talking about, uh, really the reason why Crispus Attucks is in our memory today. And he's the one that really connected the death of Attucks uh, in the Boston Massacre to the abolitionist movement. But I want us to think here, you know, here is Samuel Elliott. What is he doing in this vote? These people in this meeting, um, the black citizens of Boston, this is their congressman. They're his constituents. And I mean that literally they vote. Black men in Boston can vote at this time. And this is what he thinks of his constituents, that they should be ripped from their home if they're Lewis Hayden and returned back to bondage. This is devastating. This is a spit in the face to these, uh, to these uh, constituents here. And these people here in Boston, you can really see when they say, you know, they're children's children to be loathed and abhorred. I, I think that it makes sense. I think it's a, a reasonable response. Now I should mention, um, uh, there's gonna be a massive meeting at Faneuil Hall, literally like thousands of people gathering to protest this fugitive slave law. Uh, and among them are gonna be a couple members of King's Chapel, two men on the vestry, in fact. This is uh, George Beryl Emerson, um, vestryman from 1841 to 66, and J. Ingersoll Bowditch, um, uh, member of the vestry, 1848 to 56. So make no mistake, don't think that the congregation is a monolith in political opinion. It absolutely isn't. Um, and obviously people's views change and, and sort of evolve over time. Um, but when you look at it at this time, the real big heavy hitters in terms of influence are using that influence on the other side here. And we see that because obviously this isn't the only meeting at Faneuil Hall. We know here at the park, when there's one meeting at Faneuil Hall, there's always the opposite meeting. Uh, there's a meeting in favor of the Fugitive Save Law. And who speaks? But Benjamin Robbins Curtis. And in fact, his cousin and his, his family, most of them are there. And he states, with the rights of fugitive slaves, I firmly believe Massachusetts has nothing to do. It is right for us that they have no right to be here. Our peace and safety they have no right to invade. Whether they come as fugitives and being here act as rebels against our law, or whether they come as armed invaders. Whatever natural rights they have, and I admit those natural rights to their fullest extent, this is not the soil on which to vindicate them. And that's kind of rich here. He's saying that they have natural rights, these people escaping from slavery, and yet they don't have those natural rights in Massachusetts. It's sort of a, a little bit hypocritical here. Um, uh, but this is pretty soon going to stop being theoretical. Uh, this is about to really get serious here. And I mentioned how they're going to uh, appoint a commissioner who's going to be in charge of uh, deciding the fate of these uh, fugitives from slavery, um, not a judge or a jury. And who is that going to be? Well, it's George Tickner Curtis. And yes, if you guess by the name, is Benjamin Curtis's brother. He's a congregant at King's Chapel, and he's going to be the one to issue the warrants of arrest of two of the most high-profile cases of fugitive slaves in Boston, Shadrach Minkins and Thomas Sims. Now, you can see here pictured. You might have seen this broadside before. Um, uh, this is one that you would have seen in Boston in 1851, and it's basically giving word to those, you know, Black Bostonians to hide, to escape, many leave because of these federal marshals that are going to be coming to town and looking for people. And Shadrach Minkins is going to be one of those people. Now, again, I'm not going to get into the details of his case or the Sims case. I'm going to drop a link uh, to a really great story map explaining a little bit about that here. But basically what happens to Shadrach is he gets arrested, he goes before George Curtis, um, uh, and instead of, before they can really rule on what to do with him, a group of Black Bostonians, including Lewis Hayden and the man pictured, Robert Morris, uh, break him out of the courthouse, basically put him in a bunch of safe houses and smuggle him to Canada where he can be safe, um, uh, which they're able to do successfully. And uh, all the people involved, including Morris, are going to be brought to trial. They're going to be acquitted. Robert Morris is going to be acquitted. But despite the fact that a jury acquits him, Benjamin Robbins Curtis, the judge, 
uh, has a thing or two to say about the word of juries. As you can see here, the sole end of courts of justice is to enforce the laws uniformly and impartially without respect of persons or times or the opinions of men. To enforce popular laws is easy, but when an unpopular cause is a just cause, when a law unpopular in some locality is to be enforced there, then comes the strain upon the administration of justice. And few unprejudiced men would hesitate as to where that strain would be most firmly born. I'm basically saying here, it doesn't matter what you think about the fugitive slave law, you can disagree, but it's the law. Uh, and that's sort of the opinion of, of, of men of his ilk and of his worth here. And this argument, when he makes this uh, decision, even though Morris is acquitted, this is going to give legal backing to that fugitive slave law and legal precedent to that fugitive slave law. And while this is happening, while Morris's trial is going on, another um, fugitive is caught in Boston. That's Thomas Sims. And I should mention, this is one of the only times we're going to talk about the building of King's Chapel, because the night Sims was arrested, um, a uh, basically, the bell of King's Chapel was ringing, and the son of Daniel Webster, Fletcher Webster, was out on the town with some friends. He heard the bell ringing, assumed abolitionists were inside trying to start a riot, and he ran in and literally assaulted the man who was ringing the bell. Unbeknownst to him, that man was not an abolitionist. He was a town watchman because there was a fire a few streets over, um, so Webster got himself arrested and had to pay $200 to be out of jail. But uh, unfortunately, there was no crowd coming to save Thomas Sims. Sims, again, goes before George Tickner Curtis, King's Chapel member, commissioner here in Boston, and uh, he's sent back to slavery. And when he gets down to Savannah, Georgia, he's publicly lashed 39 times and then thrown in prison for three months. And then he's going to be enslaved for 13 years before he can finally escape in 1863 and get back to Boston. That's what happens. That's what these uh, judges, what these backers of the Fugitive Slave Law, this is the system working as intended. This is the desired result. And in the case of Benjamin Robbins Curtis, he's going to be rewarded for this and made a justice of the U.S. Supreme Court, in part for his speeches and his decisions in favor of the Fugitive Slave Law. Now, while all this is happening, in October of 1851, Ephraim Peabody decides it's time again to write about slavery. Um, he publishes another article titled Slavery, Its Evils, Alleviations, and Remedies, in which he goes into a lot about how slavery is terrible, but at least it brought civilization to Africans where they didn't have it before. He advocates in favor of, you know, African Americans returning to Africa, uh, a whole lot of really not so great things, but I've included a quotation here. He says, it is obvious that to reconstruct the whole fabric of society, which is what is implied in any wise method of abolishing slavery can never be the work of the day. To change the organic life of 10 millions of people, to change institutions and ideas rooted in the past and rot into all customs of common life must be at the best to be a very slow and gradual process. To expunge slavery from the statute book would be the least and easiest part of what is required. Far easier, certainly, than to legislate into the minds of whites and blacks the ideas which belong to free institutions. And what he's doing here, he's really reiterating in this article the same argument that Webster made on March 7th, the same argument that the Curtises have made, that slavery is wrong, it's evil, but it's not going to be gone in a day, it's foolish for abolitionists to think so, and he even says in this article that there are things worse than slavery, anarchy, insurrection, civil war. But I really want to focus here that this is Peabody, and this is true of all these people. This is true of Eliot, this is true of Webster and all the Curtises. This is privilege, right? To say that slavery is wrong, but if it saves the country, if we can keep the country together, then it, it's a necessary evil. But how could you say that if it was you who was going to be ripped from your home and shipped down to slavery? If it was your wife and children who could be separated from you and you'd never see them again? That happened to Lewis Hayden. That happened all the time. And I think if we look at it more closely, when these people, when these Whigs, men like Peabody and the Curtises, when they say that slavery is necessary if it maintains the union, it's best to look at it and say what they're saying is murder, torture, brutality. These are acceptable as long as the country is maintained. And what they couldn't see is what the abolitionists were saying. When someone like Theodore Parker says no union with slaveholders, 
what he's saying is the cost to maintain the union, uh, that murder and brutality and torture is not worth it. Why would you want to have union if the cost is that? And that's something that people like Peabody and, and some of these others couldn't really see. And unfortunately, this is gonna continue. We see in Boston, um, a really high profile case of Anthony Burns. This happens a few years later in 1854 something we're always talking about here in the park. Um, and again, I'm gonna drop a link to some information about Burns and his case. Um, he's gonna be arrested and like Sims, he's gonna be shipped back to slavery. But unlike Sims, this is pretty much gonna be it for fugitives uh, being captured in Boston because this is gonna be such a galvanizing moment. 50,000 people watch him march down State Street uh, back to slavery. And it's really sort of a flashpoint for a lot of people. And I should mention too that uh, while G George Tickner Curtis was not the commissioner. It was another King's Chapel member, uh, Edward Grayley Lauren, who was the commissioner at this time. And he was also related to the Curtises, although in a very confusing way. And so when Burns is arrested, abolitionists um, uh, led by a black minister, uh, Leonard Grimes for the 12th Baptist Church, um, uh, ask again for ministers to pray and go before the congregations and pray for Burns in this case. And Peabody writes a prayer. He responds with a prayer, uh, but it's unlikely that he brings it before the congregation. And I really, I wonder how could he? I mean, considering the fact that some of these members are the reason that Burns is even going there in the first place. And Peabody himself is kind of on the record saying that that's okay because it preserves the union. Uh, I think it really doesn't really fall in line that he would do that. Now, Peabody dies in 1856. And at that time, the compromise is pretty well broken down and we're headed on a path towards civil war. The Whig party no longer exists. It completely splits over the issue of slavery. Um, part of it is reborn into the Republican party and the rest sort of scatter about. Um, but there's one last thread we have to get to here. And obviously, as I mentioned, Peabody never lives to see the civil war. Um, uh, but the last thing is Benjamin Robbins Curtis and the end of his time on the Supreme Court because that ends in 1857 with the case of Dred Scott. Now to really kind of keep it succinct here, Dred Scott, who I have in the middle here, uh, was arguing for his freedom because he'd been enslaved in what's now Minnesota and also in the state of Illinois. And under the Missouri Compromise, slavery could not exist in the Northern Territories, uh, and that includes both Minnesota and Illinois. So he was arguing basically, I should be free by nature of having lived in the free territories. And Chief Justice Roger Tawney, the gentleman on the left, rules against Dred Scott and he delivers a pretty brutal ruling, basically saying that the compromise of uh, the Missouri Compromise is not constitutional, it no longer counts. And he argues very, very clearly that black men cannot be citizens, they aren't citizens, and they never will. And he puts it on the record, the highest judge of the land, that white people are superior to all other races. Quite literally white supremacy right in the words. And I don't mean reading between the lines, he says it clear as day. And he writes this in the majority opinion. Many consider Dred Scott to be the worst opinion in the history of the United States Supreme Court, and I'm among them. Um, but the dissent is written by Benjamin Robbins Curtis. And in fact, Dred Scott was defended by George Tickner Curtis, the, the former commissioner who sent Thomas Sims and all tried to send Shadrach Minkins back to slavery, defends Scott and Benjamin Curtis writes the dissent and he ends up resigning the court. And this is the only time this has ever happened in US history. He resigns the court in part over this decision, over Tawny's words here. And this can be seen as a redemptive moment. Like maybe, wow, Benjamin Curtis finally figured it out. Uh, but I don't see it as much. I see that he's a man, and most of these Whigs like him had spent years promoting compromise, keep the country together, compromise, compromise, compromise. And here's Tawny saying, we're not gonna compromise. Uh, slavery is here to say, slavery is the way to go. White supremacy is the way to go. And I think this is the moment that Curtis realizes that compromise is over, it's done. And obviously within a few years, that happened. The country falls apart. We go into civil war in 1861 to 65. And I wanna end with kind of what uh, I think sums up sort of this point of no return in terms of compromise, which is that famous line from Lincoln's second inaugural, a house divided cannot stand. And sometimes people say the to mean compromise, but it's the opposite action. Because what he's saying is a house cannot stand if it has both freedom and slavery. The country has to pick. It has to decide between the two 
And to go back to Ephraim Peabody's words at the very beginning, when he asked, by whom is the work to be done to abolish slavery? The point he doesn't consider at that time is what ultimately happened. In order to abolish slavery in this country, it had to be done by points of bayonet. And that's where I'm gonna wrap up right there. So um, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen here. And there we go, I'm gonna drop in the chat here. Um, uh, these uh, links here, Let's see if they work. Yeah, there we go. No? Great, well, thank you so much um, for tonight's presentation. It's very powerful. Um, if anyone has questions, um, due to the size of the group, we are gonna take them in the chat. Um, so if you did have anything you wanted to ask Will, please type it in um, and I'll fill them to him. Um, but to start with the questions that have already come in, um, earlier on you mentioned uh, the tabernacle and Dorothy asks what the tabernacle is. Um, pretty much you yeah. mentioned it. Yeah. Yeah, it just means pulpit basically there. But he's being fancy with it. There's another question in there too. Um, there was a question um, from Patrick, question regarding the commissioner. If a commissioner found the runaway slave guilty, wasn't the commissioner paid more? Yes, yeah, they were, um, they'd be paid more. Um, I think that was the marshals. Uh, the, the titles are kind of confusing, but there is there was incentive from the marshals to produce someone who was enslaved. It might've been the commissioners actually. I've seen the pay, the pay was definitely more to produce a, a guilty verdict, yes. It was heavily, I mean, you can see here, the point of this, heavily uh, incentivized. Uh, it was very much weighted to that, yeah. Does anyone have other questions they'd like to ask? Um, again, you can type them in the chat and I'll ask them to Will. And I've put the links in there to some of the things I mentioned. Um, I see Jocelyn also put, um, some more in there as well. A lot of most, everything I'm linking there is uh, on the MPS website. So you can find a lot of really great information, uh, especially considering the last few months, the online stuff has uh, definitely expanded <laughs> over the past few months here. And I really appreciate, well, all my colleagues have done a lot of great work with that over the past few months. Um, someone asked, did King's Chapel have ties to Southern churches? Yeah, so really, I mean, be, King's Chapel is such a unique case because it's really independent. So really, no, um, uh, you don't really have that. Uh, like, no one's going to be running into King's Chapel asking them to, uh, you know, disrupting the service for having those ties to the Southern churches now. Um, there is a request uh, to please talk about Reverend Peabody's stance that preaching should not be about politics or controversial subjects of the day. Yes, that's, that, that's another part of it, that Peabody definitely wanted to keep those politics out of the pulpit. Um, even though he writes about it, you know, in, you know, he had, his writings were kind of a separate thing as he was writing in the uh, Christian Examiner, which I believe that he edited that publication. Um, but yes, he wouldn't be going before his congregation talking about this stuff. He didn't think that was really right. Um, but I point out that he, he did say his opinion just uh, in other ways, but yeah, uh, definitely something there. I think that's interesting that Phillips says, he implies that he's going before his congregation and preaching this, um, but he actually really isn't. He's writing that and then kind of keeping it, you know, sort of church only on, on Sundays there, yeah. Um, Sydney asked for their plans for another presentation down the line. I'm here. I'm like, <laughs> I can do whatever, you know, that's. <laughs> Thanks, Liza. So Liza has a little question in there too. Um, 
that I'd love to know more about conversations among religious leaders. That's interesting. Yeah, I don't have a lot of access to that. I know like Peabody wrote a lot of letters. And I know that they have some of that in the archives. I think that would be something worth exploring a little bit. Um, yeah, that's that's interesting. That, that, that's something like a, a little more deeper re level of research, but uh, something definitely interesting, worth, worth, worth a, a research topic. Yes, I can see uh, Joy saying, please describe context of other Unitarian churches in Boston at the time. I mean, but again, the King's Chapel had, the, the different Unitarian churches formed under different circumstances. King's Chapel had originally been Anglican and then becomes Unitarian, and that's its congregation kind of morphing itself into that after the revolution. Whereas most of the Unitarian churches in Boston, in that all of them that aren't King's Chapel, had been congregational churches, you know, the old Puritan churches who voted themselves by nature of being congregational churches uh, into being Unitarian. That's definitely at play too. Um, I think the King's Chapel, you know, it's described as being more conservative on this issue of slavery. Um, uh, it's also kind of literally conservative because it, it comes from this Anglican, which is a little more uh, onto the Catholic end. Um, the other Unitarian churches, uh, it kind of depends. It went from church to church. You kind of had your pick. There were so many that they, you really kind of have the breadth of it there. I mean, if you were an extreme, if you really were a radical Unitarian uh, in terms of slavery, you know, you'd go to Theodore Parker's church. You know, Faye, I know, has talked before about um, Samuel Gridley Howe and Julia Ward Howe. I think their uh, relationship plays into this dynamic of Unitarian churches in Boston. He wanted to attend King's Chapel because he liked that structure of the church. She was more into the anti-slavery stuff. So they went to separate churches on Sundays. He would go to King's Chapel. She would go over to um, uh, Theodore Parker's church, which uh, was in a couple different locations, but it, well, for a while it was on Washington Street at the Melodeon, um, so not too far. <laughs> it's that quick. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Cynthia Craig. Yeah, he he did. <laughs> um, we got to Craig's question. Oops, they're going fast. Did the leadership of King's Chapel change its approach as the Civil War commenced? It's kind of, at least on my end, it's a little hard to say. Because Peabody dies when he does, uh, they don't get a permanent minister again until 1861, which is unfortunate for the purposes of a narrative, because that's a really key time, and you kind of want to know what the minister's saying, kind of what's the situation. Um, but, I mean, a lot of these same people were still in the congregation into the Civil War. But really, I think it's less that the leadership changed the country changed, uh, the situation changed. You know, I mentioned Daniel Webster's son running into King's Chapel to beat up the guy who was ringing the bell. Webster's gonna die in the Civil War. Here he was, you know, a, a very much an, an anti-abolitionist, and then he's gonna serve in the army and, and die in that conflict. The situation was completely different by the time the war had started. Um, Joy asks, what role did the textile industry play in King Chapel's decisions? So, I mean, it's obviously it's something that we talk about a lot, that a lot of these wealthy congregants had ties to the textile industry. Obviously, you know, there are, you know, Lowell's in the congregation, Lawrence's in the congregation. Um, but at least in terms of the people that I talked about tonight, most of them really don't have that. Um, yeah, Appleton, too. Uh, most of the people we were talking about here tonight actually don't really have those ties. Um, it's more of the political issues. Maybe it's the, their sort of personal ties and their sort of social ties to that. Um, but most of them aren't like literally in that business, as far as I could tell. Um, but I mean, definitely members of the congregation did. So it, it's definitely something, again, socially, I think, would have that. Um. How was the UK abolition of slavery in 1807 received? I don't know how the, you know, these people, I mean, most of these people we were talking about were, you know, quite young at that time. So I don't know how the chapel reacted to that. 
I do know that uh, something kind of interesting that I didn't talk about is that when Judge Shaw gives his decision on the um, Commonwealth v. Abe's case, uh, he has a lot of trouble pinning down when slavery was abolished in Massachusetts. Uh, like he lists like five different dates where it could be and then just decides that it doesn't really matter, it's not relevant. But he definitely mentions um, not their official end in uh, 1807, but the Somerset case in 1772, which is what kind of like uh, a predecessor to that. So um, I know it's definitely something that was talked about in Massachusetts and in Boston, but I don't know specifically how these people would have uh, been reacting to that in 1807. Um, this last one in the chat, um, it's not formatted as a question, but it kind of is a question. Um, also interested in knowing about people who didn't have public voice, but may have captured thinking, response, ideas in their private writings. All privileged people, of course, but interesting to tease out these thinkers and investigate their influence on public figures, i.e. Fanny Longfellow's influence on Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. I mean, definitely, definitely. I mean, it's, you know, with something like this, a program like this, it's hard to delve into that, you know, deeper research that would require more time in the archives, whereas most of the sources that I was dealing with here are either ones that I can access online or ones that Faye could access for me uh, from the chapel archive. So that's definitely something, and it definitely would probably give a wider look at, uh, the more nuanced look at uh, different people's opinions. Um, does anyone else have any other questions they'd like um, to ask um, Will while we have him here? Um, I'll give people a little bit of time if they wanted to type in any additional questions um, before we close up tonight's program. See some people typing, so I'm just going to wait another another moment. Um, all right. Um, great. Uh, well, it seems like that's the end of uh, the questions people have. If there is something that pops up while we're closing up, um, just let us know. Uh, but thank you so much, Will, um, and the National Parks of Boston um, for presenting this event for us. Um, I think it was eye-opening and educational for all of us. So um, thank you so much for coming. Um, and uh, let us know if you'd like uh, the recording or um, I can send out the list of resources that Will um, shared as well, if folks are interested um, in those. Thank you, Faye, and thank you, King's Chapel, for having me and for hosting this. Really happy to share all this. And thanks, everyone, who's saying nice things in the chat. I really appreciate it.